we can do many more useful things with index numbers in practice. What we have shown to this point is that index numbers are useful in comparing values that a particular variable takes on in different points in time. What other forms do index numbers come in? The header to this slide is composite index numbers. So that tells us that, or that suggests to us, that what we're going to look at are index numbers which are made up of a composite of different components or items. For example, if we are told in the media that the fuel price index has increased by a certain percentage amount from year over year, how do we interpret that? A fuel price index, after all, has many different fuels in it. More generally, we may be told that the consumer price index has increased from last year to this year by 2%. What is a consumer price index? Well, a consumer price index measures the average prices of goods that we as individuals consume in the marketplace. This indeed is a composite of goods. It has several thousand prices going into it. Or one final example, we could have a wage rate index. Every so often we read in the business pages of the media that average wage rates increased in the economy by a certain percentage year over year. But of course there are many different kinds of jobs and these different jobs all pay different wage rates. So when we say that a national wage index has increased by a certain percentage, we're implicitly saying that we're averaging over the wages of different kinds of workers, or we are averaging over the wages that are paid in different sectors in the economy or in different trades and skills. Let's take a particular example. Suppose we are interested in computing the price of fuel as an aggregate in the economy. And we imagine that there are three kinds of fuel in the economy. First of all, there is oil, then there is gas, and then there is coal. Of course, there are many more, but let's just keep things simple. So a fuel price index is going to have to be a composite of the behavior of the price index for oil, the price index for gas, and the price index for coal. But how are we going to add these up? Which one is more important than the other? Well, what we have to do is to take a weighted average with weights that reflect the importance of each of these fuels in the economy at large. If, for example, oil accounted for 60% of all energy use, natural gas accounted for 25% of all energy use, and coal accounted for 15% of all energy use, then we would have a natural set of weights here. We would take the oil price index and weight it by 0.6. We would take the gas price index and weight it by 0.25, and take the coal price index and weight it by 0.15. All of the weights add up to 1. So this formulation that we have in front of us really says that since oil is used more widely in the economy than the other two fuels, it should have a heavier consideration when we compute a fuel price index as a composite of the price indexes of its components. Now the components can move quite differently from the index as a whole. And that is what the value of the composite index is. It averages over perhaps different behaviors of the components. Here is a graphic that defines the behavior of three components of the fuel price index. And the data here come from Statistics Canada for an earlier period in time. So we have coal, we have oil, and we have gas, and we have all of them aggregated together. So you can see here that the price of coal has remained fairly steady over the time period in question. In contrast, gas 
has increased and so too has oil. So the heavy line is an average of the behavior of each of these three components. Not surprisingly, since oil is the most heavily used of the three fuels in the economy, the overall price index for fuels is quite close to the price index for oil. This then is an example of a price index which has components to it. In this particular example, we just have three components. The consumer price index, however, has several thousand components. It is the most widely used cost of living measure in the economy, and it is the basis for computing the annual inflation rate or the annual deflation rate. How do we compute the consumer price index? Well, what we have to do is to take an average, this is a composite, of all of the prices of the goods that we consume in the base year. Then we come to the current year, the year in which we're interested in, year T prices, also a composite of the many thousands of prices of the goods that are consumed. So we first of all average the prices of the goods consumed in the base year and in all subsequent years. And then to get the consumer price index, we divide the price, the consumer price index value in the current year by its value in the base year, multiply by 100, and that gives us what we call the consumer price index with a base of 100. So what use is the consumer price index? The use of the consumer price index is that if we are interested in the behavior of the price of a particular good or product or service in the economy, having a consumer price index on the side will tell us if the particular good that we are interested in has increased in price relatively more than the prices of goods in general, whose prices are represented by the consumer price index. So if we want to get what we call a real index or a real price for a particular good, what we do is we look at how the price of the particular good we are interested in has changed relative to the average of all prices of the goods that we consume. So we divide the nominal price index by the consumer price index. This is also called a constant dollar index. Here is an example. It's an example which deals with wages or earnings. In Canada, between 2003 and 2011, the average hourly earnings increased by 27.5% over this eight-year period. That is to say, when we look at the dollar value of wages in the different sectors of the economy, and we average over all of these different sectors, and we map their behavior from 2003 to 2011, we find that wages have gone up, or earnings have gone up, by 27.5%. However, the 27.5% increase in earnings doesn't necessarily tell us very much about how well off workers are, because we don't know by how much prices have gone up in the economy. If prices have gone up by more than 27.5%, then average hourly earnings are not keeping up with the price level. However, if prices in the economy at large have gone up by less than 27.5%, then earnings have gone up by more than the increase in the cost of living. And so we can say there has been a real increase in the wages or the earnings that people earn in general. Over this time period, the consumer price index increased by 16.6%. So if we look at these two numbers, we can immediately see that in real terms, that is to say in purchasing power terms, workers are better off in 2011 than they were in 2003 on average. 
Why? Because the increase in earnings was 27.5%. The increase in the consumer price index was 16.6%. And consequently, there was what we call a real increase in earnings in the economy during this time period. What is the numerical value of the real increase in hourly earnings? We can get that by dividing one series into the other once again. We are going to show by a simple division that real average hourly earnings increased by 9.4%. How do we do this? Well, we take the value of earnings in different periods. We take the value of the consumer price index in different periods, divide one into the other, and we get real earnings. So in this table here, we have nominal earnings, that is to say, earnings given in dollar values, not adjusted by the consumer price index. And over here, we are going to adjust these earnings by the consumer price index, and we will get a real index of earnings. So we have a consumer price index series in here in the middle. The consumer price index is going to be what we will use to adjust the nominal earnings in order to get real earnings. So let's take this number here, average hourly earnings in 2011 of 127.5. So relative 2003, average hourly earnings have gone up by 27.5% by 2011. The consumer price index in the same time period has gone up by 16.6%, as we can see from the final entry in the consumer price index column. How do we go from this nominal change in hourly earnings to a real change in hourly earnings? We take the nominal earnings divided by the consumer price index, and that will give us what we have in the final column over here. So to get this figure of 109.4, we take the value 127.5 divided by 116.6, and that is the answer that we will get. So real earnings have gone up by 9.4% during this time period. That is to say, the nominal earnings have increased by more than the consumer price index. They have increased by more than the consumer price index to the extent of 9.4%. So we have an increase in real earnings of 9.4%. So here is a formal statement of how we get that number. We take the nominal value divided by the consumer price index, scale the result by 100, and we get the index of real average hourly earnings.